of the myriad alphabet soup agencies created by President Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal to speed recovery from the Great Depression, none is better known than the WPA. The Works Progress Administration over its eight-year history employed more than 8.5 million Americans on 1.4 million projects, and it spent $11 billion in the process. The WPA left its mark on roads, bridges, parks, airports, and 125,000 public buildings, many of them constructed in a distinctive architectural style utilizing rough local stone. But in Oklahoma and other states, it has left a cultural and artistic legacy as well. On this State Line History Special, we learn the WPA was more than buildings. Ask someone about the WPA in Oklahoma and they'll probably tell you about one of the hundreds of highways it built. Every county in the state had dozens of WPA projects. It built stadiums and libraries, parks and bridges, dams and swimming pools. Of the 126 National Guard armories built by the WPA nationwide, 51 are in Oklahoma. One thing that Oklahoma holds the record for, and we want people to know that, is that WPA built 825 schools in Oklahoma, which was the most of any state in the United States. But few people know the WPA also put artists, writers, actors, and musicians to work, creating a legacy every bit as concrete as those set in mortar and stone. We have artworks that are valuable that were created during those times. We have interviews and history books uh, that were produced during those times, and those are valuable to people. The WPA provided funding, but allowed communities to choose the projects. In some towns, half the people were out of work. In order to feed the most people per paycheck, the WPA usually hired the head of a household. When the WPA was set up, it was meant to help the family where they live. And generally, those people were well past 30. It started with a song. Oklahoma City had a symphony orchestra in the 1920s, but it broke up after a few years. If you were an orchestral musician and you wanted to play in a symphony orchestra, you know, um, there wasn't all that much for you to do. We have to remember this was the radio era. There would have been small radio ensembles. <laughs> full-time job playing in a professional orchestra that was non-existent until the WPA came along here. During the six years the city was without an orchestra, the WPA formed the Federal Music Project and appointed Dean Richardson to run the new Federal Symphony Orchestra. It took some time to get it up and running and during that time, then we're talking about 1937, they were busy auditioning musicians and they started it in Tulsa. That's where they, they first planted um, the seeds of the symphony orchestra. The WPA Federal Symphony Orchestra started in Tulsa. Many people viewed the WPA as welfare, 
and Tulsa oil men didn't want what they called Roosevelt fiddlers playing in their town. It wasn't that they didn't want an orchestra in Tulsa, but the citizens in charge decided they didn't want a federal orchestra. So they, they basically kicked it out. Richardson moved it down the highway to Oklahoma City, and then Tulsa began its own symphony orchestra. So the Tulsa Symphony started immediately after the WPA orchestra left and came, came across the highway here. But they were missing a bassoon, and apparently in this neck of the woods, finding a bassoon was a really hard thing. So uh, they plucked out of Oklahoma City University uh, Betty Johnson, who has been known and is still known by many, many people here, because Betty Johnson didn't retire from playing until 1992. The orchestra, from its first days, was out and about, playing as many concerts as they could, because the nature of taking the federal money meant that they were going to serve the state. It was going to be a state orchestra, to the extent that they could get out and about. So what they did was they put out the word all over the state, you know, that this was a wonderful thing, a symphony orchestra, and it would be a great thing to have it come to your town and please invite us. So if they went to Anadarko or Claremore or whatever, the local paper would write a review and it was almost the circuses coming to town, you know, come hear this fabulous federal orchestra and come see for yourself, you know, these amazing musicians. They were playing in high school auditoriums, typically. If you, if you go to a small rural community in, in any state, you know, the biggest auditorium in town is going to be the high school. But people were so thrilled to have the orchestra that they didn't really care. Musicians would spend hours on dusty roads, playing two and three concerts a day in every corner of the state. They would basically bus the orchestra to whatever town was hosting and drop them off. And they would make their way through the town and find the best place to eat and find a place to hang out and that kind of thing. They played their first concerts here in town in what was called at the time the Shrine Auditorium. And we know that now as a very different building. Um, it transformed itself into the Journal Record Building, and now, of course, it houses the Memorial Museum. Its second year, the orchestra moved across the couple of blocks, and the Civic Center became its home, Municipal Auditorium. The Federal Orchestra changed its name several times until its final breakup in 1988. The federal funding went away after the first three years. The WPA had a limited purse string on it. The federal government was not going to fund the orchestra forever. So within three years or so, they had to get off the federal dole. And, and they were told from the beginning, you know, we, the federal government will start this project. You're going to have to then get local support. By the time the musicians came back from the war, it was, an, it was fa uh, funded by local citizens. In western Oklahoma, the WPA was busy planting shelter belts, rows of trees to keep the soil from blowing away. At the same time, Dr. Grant Foreman of the State Historical Society was putting writers to work, preserving the stories of the people who pioneered territorial Oklahoma. Grant Foreman just selected, I don't know, 80 to 100 writers throughout Oklahoma. A lot of them were just taken directly from the relief rolls. A lot of teachers and um, well, former office people, clerical people, were usually the ones that were um, hired in the writer's section, the writer's project section. They were professionals. And I, I think that having a job and having a, having a professional task to do 
was probably as important as the money they got. They just went to where the person lived, sat down and had a list of questions to ask them to get them started talking. And most of those stories would have been lost had they not been recorded. They were instructed to find people who would remember the pioneer experience. So they needed elderly people. We have some people in our book, we, found, we have interviews from people who were 100 years old or more. Questionnaires were sent out to people, maybe in the thousands, and interviewed as many people as they could, including ex-slaves. See, in, 19, in the 1930s, we still had people who were born as slaves. The slaves, the Native Americans, and other pioneers were interviewed. Some stories were of incredible bravery, but I, I don't know if they thought of it as bravery. Uh, one woman told the story, she, she must have been in her 20s. She had two or three children under five, and she and her husband are going to Texas. Her husband has a heart attack crossing Red River. One of the ponies fell under the wagon tongue and could not get up. So I called to my husband who was pushing behind. I saw at once that something was wrong with him. He climbed into the wagon and fell backward on the bed. There I was, miles from a human being, only the babies in the wagon. And I thought my husband might be dying and one of the horses down and could not get up. Kissick a wolf. This woman takes care of her children revives her husband, gets the horses up out of the quicksand, gets back on the bank, hires a guide, and then goes on into Texas, into the journey. You've got to realize that in 1930, uh, some of those people were remembering things um, clear back right after the Civil War. One story, I, uh, some of them were kind of funny. A man and a friend of his were bringing liquor back illegally uh, from Arkansas. They also had a load of corn with them that they were going to use to feed their hogs. And as they were coming back from Arkansas into eastern Oklahoma, they thought they saw someone in the distance on a horse and believing it to be um, a law agencies, they emptied the liquor out onto the corn. It was absorbed by the corn, and so by the time the guy got there, there was no liquor. It was all in the corn. So they drove on home in their wagon, pressed the liquor out of the corn, and uh, got the liquor out of it and fed the corn to the hogs. The hogs uh, got kind of drunk, and I, we just thought we'd refer to that as the drunk hog story. I think it's probably goes into the same reason why we record any of history, that we, we f suddenly get an urge that we feel that those stories need to be told. I think there are 112 volumes, and... One set is owned by the Oklahoma Historical Society, the other by OU at the Western History Collection. They are not taking the images of people who were kings of industry or bankers. They were taking the people who actually owned the fields or worked in the fields, uh, women who kept house, who raised their children. And, and I, I think that a part of it is legacy. As soon as the WPA crews finished a new building, WPA artists were hard at work inside. Vanessa Jennings is the granddaughter of Stephen Mopope, 
one artist in a group known as the Kiowa Five. Uh, they all uh, came together as young students at the Indian Mission at St. Patrick's. They had um, art supplies that were made available to them and I think most of the children had a talent for art but the, these this particular group they seem, they seem to live and breathe uh, art. Their work was widely distributed, and some of it fell into the hands of the head of the art department at OU. Dr. Jacobson, he didn't want to force uh, the modern world's idea of what art was. He allowed them to pursue and promote uh, their style of Kiowa traditional art. Through Jacobson's influence, Stephen Mopope, Spencer Asa, and James Ochai were hired by the WPA to paint murals in public buildings across the state. Two were in Seminary Hall at Northeastern State University in Tahlequah. When you walk into this building, um, it's a rather imposing building. But when you walk in, you know that there is an Indian presence here. The arts are extremely important. You know, they, they uh, feed people's memories. And I think they, they nurture our spirits. And, and I think that the buffalo hunt is a part of that nostalgia. On the second floor, that painting is, is about the dance. And by the 1930s, dances, Indian dances were being performed uh, all over Oklahoma. Other murals are in Muskogee, Oklahoma City, and the post office in Anadarko. He was really proud of those. Um, and he really did, he considered himself uh, a wall muralist. Mind you, this is before the age of the slide projector where you can easily project a figure up on the wall and then pencil it in. This is all just excellent eye-hand coordination. He had a, a really strong um, knowledge of uh, body movements. He had a strong knowledge of uh, uh, the uh, traditions of the Kiowa people. Jennings used to sit and listen to her grandfather's stories of painting at the post office. He used to paint during the day, but he had uh, uh, so many of his elders would sit uh, on the on the on the floor and they would watch him. And uh, you know, the, there were some women elders who were, you know what, you shouldn't be putting that uh, woman in there, uh, working on that buffalo hide. You know, it smells. Nobody would ever set up a, a buffalo hide that close to a camp. So Grandpa started working at night, <laughs> you know. So it was just, a, it just went a whole lot easier for him, he said. There aren't a whole lot of these murals left in public buildings as the, as the post offices and courthouses and so on get remodeled or moved. Sometimes those, those artworks are lost. Every day the students go by it and they see that history. And at the same time, they are, these students are taking classes and the history is right there on the walls for them to look at. And I, I, think, that's, I think that's what the legacy is. I think that people have continued to to be nurtured by these things. We have to know who we are. We need to know who we are. The WPA, I know for my grandfather, it was a godsend. It was an opportunity to share with the world what was important to him. And it was his, uh, his uh, world of what was the most beautiful and the most special that the Kiowas had to offer. And it was their history, it was their tradition, it was their, sing their singing, it was their stories. WPA 
provided a chance for the world to see the love between a Kiowa grandfather with his grandson, or the tenderness of, a, of an old Kiowa grandmother as she sings and holds her favorite grandchild. Those are all things, um, love, death, uh, uh, family, uh, God, uh, uh, it's, it's all there. It's recorded forever. Most of the WPA buildings are mute reminders of the emotional distress and physical pain suffered by Oklahomans. But a few speak loud and clear to give comfort and hope. The holy city of the Wichitas sits at the base of Mount Scott near Medicine Park. It got started way back in 1926. Reverend Wallach was a pastor of a church downtown Lawton. And on, on uh, Easter Eve, he came out to, uh, out to the Medicine Park area with a few of his uh, church members and also his Sunday class a school from Medicine Park and held a sunrise service on top of one of the peaks over in the Medicine Park area. That was the first performance, so to speak. And that continued like that until uh, this place, the actual Holy City area, uh, was built, and then it was moved here. And this was built, by the way, by WPA. And uh, a grant was authorized for about $94,000. President Roosevelt authorized a use lease or whatever for 160 acres right here at the base of uh, Mount Roosevelt. And the WPA came out and constructed all these natural stone buildings that you see have seen around here today. And, uh, and in 1935, this area was dedicated and they had their first pageant here that year. Of course, we've got this beautiful hill out here that the spectators sit on. And I'm told, I wasn't here for it, but I'm told that the first year it was held here, that there were 82,000 spectators on the hill out there. And if you look at that hill, it makes you wonder they must have acted like they liked each other a lot because they had to sit pretty close together to get that many people on the hill out here. The largest turnout ever was in 1939. That year, 225,000 people jammed Audience Hill for a sunrise performance. People came from Europe. People have come from all over the world to see the Easter badge right here. This is the longest running outdoor passion play in the country, if not the world longest continuous run, certainly in the United, longest one running in the United States. Many of the players can point to a parent or grandparent who played a part for years and then passed it on, just as families have come out to watch for generations. Every year we have a new Christ child for the manger, and sometimes we'll, the families, that will continue. So they'll be, they'll be through with it as children and as adults as well. They just move up the street as far as parts are concerned. Uh, they'll, be, they'll be in the children's scene for the blessing of the children. The next thing you know, they'll become angels. That's what my granddaughter did this year. And then, and then they're large enough as teenagers, they can be in the crowd scenes. And so then the next thing you know, they'll be in key parts. Once we get it, once people come and start, they pretty much stay. As the sun goes down on Saturday night before Easter, crowds spread blankets on the facing hilltop, and the actors step into the light. The first time you see a hillside full of angels, that a moment ago it was dark, and when the lights come on, there are these angels with huge sets of wings, some of them iridescent, some of them with different colors coming. Oh, it's spectacular. It made the hair stand up on my uh, neck. It did for me, I can tell you that, and it still does.
those who benefited from the WPA saw the program as the margin between starvation and survival, life and death. Almost all the workers are gone now, and every day we benefit from the culture and history they preserved. President Roosevelt and his New Deal are often criticized by both the left and the right. And it can be argued that the Second World War did more to end the Great Depression than did all the government programs of the 1930s. Civilian unemployment dropped from 14% in 1940 to less than 2% in 1943. Nevertheless, the legacy of the WPA is as enduring as any government project ever undertaken. And as we've seen, it was much more than buildings. Once I built a railroad, now it's done. Brother, can you spare a dime? For a VHS or DVD copy of this program, please call 800-879-6382 or send a check or money order for $22.95 to the OETA Foundation, Post Office Box 14190, Oklahoma City, 73113.